Um, I would like to, to thank the organizers for the very kind invitation. It's a great honor for me to be here today, and I feel that I have learned a lot during these last uh, two days, hearing these wonderful talks. Uh, given the 10-hour jet lag uh, difference, uh, if I happen to fall asleep during my talk, please wake me up. So, that, uh... so um, I'm not sure whether this is going to be a provocative talk, because I'm going to talk about something that is so obvious and so evident. It, you know, people have been talking about that since science began, and probably it has been summarized very nicely in the 1940s by Robert Merton in his uh, Sociology of Science and Epistemology writings. So the, the ability of self-correction is considered a main feature of science. And in a cumulative meta-analysis fashion, this means that we may start way off from the truth, but if we accumulate more evidence, if we correct some of the prior evidence, if we add more evidence, we will be able to reach closer and closer to the truth. But self-correction is often not happening. And uh, why is that? that? Well, it could be impeded by different mechanisms. And I could summarize these mechanisms as destruction of evidence, production of wrong evidence, and or distortion of evidence. These are not new threats. Um, I will go back a couple of thousand years and uh, think about why um, the Greek civilization collapsed. There's many potential reasons. Economics obviously would be one. Uh, and Greece still has a problem on this front. Um, <laughs> but probably one major reason that is not discussed very often is that um, ancient scholarship lost its scientific records. It's lost its record eventually. At, at the peak of uh, this civilization, the Library of Alexandria, which was the largest library in the ancient world, had over a thousand volumes of information worth of, of scholarship. And uh, it was destroyed four times until final extinction with uh, roughly uh, a little less than 1% surviving at, at the moment. And this includes kind of painful retrieval of uh, papyrus and uh, parchment fragments uh, coming out of digging in the desert, for example. And um, here's the four waves of destruction. Uh, one was a love affair, uh, Julius Caesar, trying to defend his mistress and possibly also the interests of Rome. Um, he had to burn part of the city and part of that, unfortunately, was the library and the museum. And then another war between Emperor Aurelian and Queen Zenobia of Palmyra, uh, second blow. Then about a century later, Christian mobs were motivated by the zealot Pope of Alexandria to destroy the hallmarks of uh, a pagan uh, civilization of non-believers. And then uh, a couple of centuries later, uh, I will spare you the Latin, but uh, when the Arabs captured the city, uh, John uh, Grammaticus pleaded, can we save these books? They're so important for us. So uh, the general had to ask uh, the central headquarters and he got the reply that, uh, well, if these books are consistent with our book, uh, then we don't need them. And uh, if they're not consistent with our book, uh, then we should get rid of them. So uh, replication was not uh, a very good idea. I know that the sense that something could be corrected was not considered as an option. Now, also scientists could be destroyed, not just uh, scientific work. So uh, along with uh, the destruction of the library, uh, also uh, Hypatia of Alexandria uh, was torn to pieces by the mobs of, of Christians who felt that mathematics and science was uh, not something to be pursued. Now the question is, um, can we also have production of wrong evidence or distortion of evidence? Of course, we have several historical examples. Uh, if we go back uh, about 150 years, uh, this is phrenology, a phrenology map. Um, and uh, how was that science carried out? Well, people had calipers that they would place on the scalp, and they would measure different pieces or parts of the scalp, and then they would say that uh, uh, this part of the scalp associates with emotion, this one with pleasure, this one with cognitive ability, and, and so forth. And it, it, it was a huge literature uh, in the context of Victorian society, phrenology was a respectable scientific theory. The Phrenological Society of Edinburgh, founded by George and Andrew Combe, was an example of the credibility of phrenology at the time. In 1826, out of the 120 members of the Edinburgh Society, an estimated one-third were, were from a formal medical background. By the 1940s, there were over 28 phrenological societies in London with over 1,000 members. Now, that was history, but how about nowadays? Could it be, for example, that several libraries of Alexandria disappear daily? 
My argument is that they do disappear right now as we are speaking. Uh, the amount of evidence that is generated in the scientific literature is in the order of petabytes on a daily basis. It's, it's several libraries of Alexander being produced on a daily basis. Uh, Peter uh, Doshi showed this very nice uh, pile of 8,000 pages. Try to do the same thing for a molecular experiment where you have millions of observations. You know, literally the pile will go through the roof and uh, uh, way above the spiral of the, of the cathedral. Uh, and uh, this information is produced. Some people take a look at it, but then uh, most of us, uh, everybody else, cannot really look at it and see whether they agree or disagree. People who seek knowledge continue to be shot nowadays. So um, as I was coming in, I read uh, on my flight in that a 14-year-old uh, child in uh, Pakistan had been shot because she wanted to go to school and be educated. And uh, it's possible that many phrenologies circulate in biomedical journals still. Uh, I'm not sure I would like to name one in particular uh, because obviously I will probably add to the pile of my enemies, but uh, uh, you know, definitely it's not the topic that you're working on, so uh, don't worry about it. Um, now, possibilities for discovery and replication. Th this is a very naive way of uh, uh, categorizing what could happen. And uh, I, I will use a, a binary mode of correct, wrong. Obviously, you can think also of effect sizes if it's a, a measurement that has a treatment effect or an association effect, but, but the, the rationale would still be similar. So the, the optimal approach is that we make a discovery and it's a correct discovery and then we replicate it and the replication is also correct. The self-correcting paradigm is when the discovery is wrong but the replication is correct and therefore we get rid of whatever error we made. The false non-replication, the discovery is correct but the replication is wrong. The perpetuated fallacy, the discovery is wrong, the replication is also wrong. And challenge fallacy, discovery is wrong, replication not done at all. And unconfirmed by genuine discovery, discovery is correct, but the replication again is not done, so to feel a little bit more confident that it's okay. So here's uh, one example. Uh, diet causes cancer, does it not? Of course it does. If you open the medical literature, you will see tons of papers relating diet to cancer. So instead of uh, opening uh, PubMed or some uh, journal on nutrition or some general medical journal, uh, along with uh, John Shunfield from Harvard, a very bright fellow, we decided to open a cookbook. So we took uh, a century old cookbook, the Boston cookbook. It's been out there since the late 1890s or so and it's had several editions since then. It's very popular in uh, many uh, cooking uh, schools. And we randomly picked 50 ingredients. Uh, we, we had a random number generator. We picked the pages and then we picked the recipes and then we picked ingredients from these recipes. How many of those are associated with increased or significantly or decreased cancer risk in the scientific literature? What would you think? Now we go to, not to the cookbook, but uh, really PubMed and you know, the scientific record. 50 ingredients, common things that we eat every day. I'm, I'm sure all of us had some of them this morning, unless uh, you're starving to death. Uh, or, um, so I'll, I'll give you the answer. 40 of them are associated with increased or decreased risk based on the scientific literature. Uh, and this is the list of them. Uh, very common things. Uh, veal, salt, pepper, spice, flour, egg, bread, pork, butter, tomato, lemon, dark onion, celery, carrot, parsley, maize, cherry, olive, mushroom, tripe, milk, cheese, coffee, bacon, sugar, lobster, potato, beef, lamb, mustard, nuts, wine, peas, corn, cinnamon, cayenne, orange, tea, rum, and raisin. A few are not, uh, like you don't see vanilla here, but if you were to check the ingredients, uh, you will find, for example, vanillin, and you know, then there will be studies about the biochemical uh, substances that are within the ingredient that might still be associated with cancer risk. So no matter what you eat, you increase or decrease your risk of cancer. And this is how it looks like if you plot these relative risks. Um, these are just uh, some of the most uh, common cancers, uh, and these are the, some of the most common ingredients. Uh, uh, you, you see that uh, there's both protection and susceptibility, and actually some of the effects. We're talking about typical effects of 0 0.3 or 3, which means that by eating one more serving, you triple your risk of cancer, or you cut it by two-thirds, hmm, just uh, serving more of, of whatever. And, and then this is uh, how it looks like if you look at specific ingredients. So for example, wine is on both sides, uh, 
several studies, significant results that you decrease risk, others you significantly increase risk. Uh, tomatoes on both sides, tea on both sides. Sugar, uh, mostly on the bad side, salt always on the bad side. Uh, <laughs> and uh, potatoes uh, also on both sides, uh, both good and bad. So uh, maybe it's, it's all true, I, I don't know, but the, if you plot the, uh, the z-scores, which are just transformations of the p-values, this is how they look like. Uh, the green color is what you see in the abstract, and the others are what you see for main outcomes. Uh, if you look at the full text, you, you see that bimodal distribution in the single study. So uh, abstracts don't have any non-significant results, more or less. Uh, everything that is in the abstract, if it makes it there, it's a significant result. If you, if you go to the full text, you will find a little bit more. But then who knows how much more information has been available that is nowhere to be found. If you look at the meta-analysis of, of these ingredients, you see less of that by modality. So uh, lots of the meta-analysis are closer to the null, but there's still some effects that could be sizable. Almost all biomedical studies currently are statistically significant. This has been shown again and again. I'm going to show you a few examples based on what is reported. So uh, in a survey of 389 epidemiological studies published in major, general, and uh, specialty uh, journals, 89% of them highlighted statistically significant relative risks. Uh, this is another field, uh, tumor markers. Uh, there's uh, about 2,000 papers on tumor markers published every year, and uh, the field has gained so much in the trust of uh, the medical community that uh, out of the 50,000 papers, about 10 biomarkers for cancer are currently used in clinical practice. Uh, what happens to the others? Well, uh, they fail. No, not really. All of the studies are significant. So. Uh, if you take a look at uh, these two data sets that we analyzed, 340 prognostic marker uh, studies that had been included in meta-analysis and uh, another 15 and 75 that had been published in a single year in 2005, other than 9.4% and 4.2% were statistically significant associations of that biomarker on particular cancer types. And actually, even these few, the, the, that black slice of quote-unquote negative studies were actually not negative. Almost all of them had something to say that was positive. So they would claim significance for other non-prognostic analysis. They would discuss non-significant trends. Or they would uh, offer apologies, as I would call it. So that, that last category is uh, uh, the, the classic example is one paper that uh, had 127 p-values scattered throughout the tables and figures and and the text, all of them nowhere close to even a p-value of 0.05. However, the conclusion of the abstract was that uh, clearly this is a very important biomarker as we have shown in our previous study. <laughs> so um, this is a, a very nice uh, paper in PLOS One by uh, Daniel Fanelli. Well, he did th a similar analysis, but on a very broad scale, looking across a number of scientific fields to try to see how many of studies in different scientific fields end up with significant results in the published record. And, and you see that it's the majority of them, the vast majority. And actually, there is an increasing trend as you move down what uh, uh, Daniel calls the hierarchy of science. So if, if you move from uh, hardcore physics uh, to biological sciences and then to psychological and sociological uh, sciences, the proportion of significant results increases even to the point of reaching close to 95% for psychology and psychiatry. And if you look at uh, applied versus pure sciences, uh, again, uh, you see the, the gradient that is pretty clear if you move from physical sciences to biological and to social sciences, but when you look at applied research, it's almost always uh, significant, very close to, to 90%. Maybe this is just an embarrassment of riches, so maybe all of that uh, knowledge that is reported in the literature is true and we should just be very happy of that because then uh, we just can can sit back and uh, say, okay, no need to do more research for now. We have so many things that we know and, and uh, we can use all of them maybe in applications. But unfortunately, empirical studies suggest that most of the claimed statistically significant effects in traditional medical research are probably either false positives or substantially exaggerated in the magnitude of the effect size. Uh, there is a, a whole issue of perspectives on psychological science that will be coming out in the next month or two that includes 12 papers of empirical meta-research evaluations in the psychological sciences at large. And uh, I, I was uh, very uh, honored to uh, write an 
overarching paper summarizing the findings of these empirical studies. So I have tried to put together some of the findings from that analysis of uh, the whole psychology literature. These are the six paradigms that I, that I described earlier. What happens to discovery results, correct or wrong, and what happens to replication results, correct, wrong, or not obtained. And in psychology literature, uh, replication happens only 4% of the time. 96% uh, of the psychological literature, nobody wants to touch to replicate. Even that 4%, 80% of the 4% is done by the same team who published the original data. And of the other 20% uh, of, of the 4%, uh, much of the time it's a conceptual replication. So people don't want to try to replicate exactly the same experiment. They try a little bit different so that they can lay. You know, we did something different and we got the same result or whatever. So the numbers, the empirical numbers, suggest that really most of the action is here. Apparently, most of the action is unchallenged fallacies, uh, and there can be some uncertainty about the exact percentages. I have put some numbers there indicatively. And very, very little, less than 1%, is the optimal example, and less than 1% is the self-correcting example. So here's another field, uh, genomic association studies. Uh, this is a field that has about uh, 5,000 papers published every year. Um, the classic example is some gene is associated with some disease. And uh, th that was a highly prolific literature. Uh, the typical approach until, let's say, five or six years ago was that someone would have to think very carefully based on biological plausibility or uh, you know, a dream that uh, came to his sleep or, or whatever, that that particular gene variant among the 15 million that we have in our uh, genome uh, is related to the risk of that particular disease. So uh, I mean, how that came to be, I don't know, but, but people were doing this. I was doing this. I, I had clairvoyance and uh, I, could, I could see very far. And, uh, uh, and you know, we, we published lots of these papers uh, claiming that we found a gene associated with, to that disease, doing that one gene at a time. And this is pretty much what any epidemiologist would do, not just with genes, but with any risk factor. So now comes the paradigm shift. Instead of working one team at a time and with small studies, we decide that we need consortia. We join forces, large consortia of investigators, and uh, we run very large studies, and we test the whole genome. So. There are empirical studies that have tested all the genes that were proposed to be associated with major depression, with smoking, with acute coronary syndrome, with osteoporosis, coronary artery disease, and so forth. If you add these, there's about 1,200 genes that had been proposed to be the gene for, and now this is the replication. So the, the replication rate is uh, uh, 13 out of 1,200. That's about 1.1%. Uh, obviously, some of the replication could be wrong or, or underpowered or who knows. So maybe 5% or 10% of those proposed associations were correct, but still a very small number. There's uh, more evaluations uh, empirically uh, done recently in several fields uh, in drug development. And usually you hear that the industry is bad and that academia is good. but um, Anyone, anyone working in the industry in the room? Okay. So the, the industry are my heroes for the last several years. And, and why is that? Because there are several teams, including teams from Amgen and Bayer, that said, you know what? We get all these fancy reports from academic investigators, and we can never replicate them. Let's try to do it in, in massive scale. So they did that. And this is one evaluation. They couldn't replicate 89% of the proposed associations. 89% of high-profile investigations could not be replicated. And uh, uh, sorry, the, the one that I showed you was 67%, and another one by Amgen was 89%, uh, uh, actually. Uh, landmark studies for oncology drug target projects. So this is what they say in the paper published a few months ago in Nature. The failure to win the war on cancer has been blamed on many factors, but recently a new culprit has emerged. Too many basic scientific discoveries are just wrong. Maybe these papers are not cited. So yeah, we can have them there, but everybody knows they're wrong. So why, why worry about it? Actually, they are as well cited as those that are replicated. And actually, if anything, there's a trend for those pieces that cannot be replicated to be even a little bit more cited than the others. So whom would you ask to 
be the optimal and final and ultimate expert about scientific credibility, about a hedge fund. Hmm? I mean, you're going to place your money and, and you know, risk your, your investment. So hedge funds currently really don't want to spend money on placing risk in academic research. Uh, this is from uh, a paper on uh, Scientific Business Express. At least 50% of published studies, even those in top tier academic journals, cannot be repeated with the same conclusions by an industrial lab. The potential for not being able to reproduce academic data is a disincentive to early stage investors. And uh, currently, most hedge funds would uh, trust less than 50% of uh, scientific research, even in the best journals by the best teams, to be credible. Why research findings may not be credible in the literature? Practically, there's two pieces that could contribute to that. There's bias and there's random error, um, meaning lots of comparisons being done, and uh, usually there's plenty of both. I always wanted to come up with a list of biases in biomedical research, so I had started reading uh, slowly but steadily the biomedical literature. Um, I had read a few hundred papers but had about 17 million uh, to go at that time, and now it's 22 million, of course. Um, and uh, then I met David Chevalarias, a very bright uh, physicist from the Ecole Polytechnique in Paris, and uh, he said, well, we can read the literature overnight. Why don't you go to sleep and uh, I'll, I'll take a look. So this is a, a map of uh, 17 million papers mapping the biases that exist in biomedical research. There's 235 main types of biases that create a galaxy of interconnected nodes uh, that could co-appear sometimes. This is not a microarray experiment. It's uh, a time array for biases. It's, uh, again, from the same analysis, starting from the 1960s to 2009. And uh, these are the most commonly reported terms. So if, if you see black, that means that uh, no one is talking about that bias. If you see white, this means that uh, this is a very commonly discussed bias. So things like confounding, um, people start talking about in the 1960s, and now everybody's talking about confounding. Selection bias, publication bias, response bias, very common things. Now, talking about bias does not mean that bias is eliminated. So the, the classic appearance of confounding is somewhere in the discussion, a paragraph. We have to acknowledge that confounding is a threat for epidemiological research. However, our study does not have a problem because we did X or Y or Z. So it's used more, more of an alibi. Same thing for meta-analysis. You will see very common discussion of publication bias somewhere in the discussion. Um, publication bias is always a threat to meta-analysis. However, we believe that our meta-analysis is not subject to publication bias. So that, that, that's the most common way that this is being phrased. Sometimes uh, we do have replication efforts and, and we do see some of the effect sizes evaporating. Uh, this is uh, very common, for example, in uh, human genome epidemiology. Uh, these are all examples from high-impact journals like uh, Nature, Lancet, Journal of Clinical Investigation, publishing some association of some gene with uh, some uh, phenotype of interest. Significant result when the first result is published, but as we perform more data and uh, you have the cumulative meta-analysis trajectory, it converges towards the null. And at the latest update, it's no longer even nominally significant. Even the creme de la creme research could have a high refutation rate. This is an empirical evaluation looking at the 49 most highly cited papers in the clinical research biomedical literature. And out of those, five out of six that had observational designs were refuted or found to be grossly exaggerated within a few years of their publication. And about a quarter of those that had a randomized controlled trial design were also refuted or found to be grossly exaggerated. So, the reporting forces uh, seem to converge to what one could call an excess significance bias. Uh, and I will try to simplify the theory of excess significance bias and then add some qualifications to that. Um, let's say for, for a moment that people just like positive results, statistically significant results. How could they get that? They could do that by, of course, getting genuine significant results, yes. Uh, but also you could have results that become positive while they should have been negative. So the analysis is modified compared to the original intention. Um, something is done differently. Something is distorted in the process. And something that should have been negative ends up being positive. 
Second possibility, results that are negative are suppressed, the classic publication bias. And the third is that fake positive results are created, so you have clear fraud. And this is how it looks like. Uh, schematically, data may exist, but uh, not get published or be distorted by selective reporting and analysis and outcomes uh, or so forth. Or no data exists and you just uh, imagine results uh, that uh, are positive. I, I think that this is what attracts most attention. And obviously, when you see fraud, uh, everything goes off. But um, I believe that fraud is probably very uncommon compared to the other mechanisms. And I, I would argue that this mechanism is by far the most common in most scientific fields. This could operate in several fields. I think this is more common most of the time, and this is pretty uncommon. But this is based on some evidence and, and also some gut feeling, which may well be wrong. So here's uh, one example of uh, publication bias, or, or time lag bias, actually. Bad news taking longer to appear. This is a literature that has absolutely no conflict of interest. This is NIH-sponsored trials run by the NIH and by academic investigators, the industry uh, that may have some conflict to promote these technologies being tested has no way to interfere in the analysis, design, contact, publication of the results. And uh, it's all done by the best teams uh, run by NIH. Uh, it's for HIV disease. Everybody wants to get the complete picture because they want to find a treatment for HIV disease, which eventually we did get. And if you get a non-significant result for a phase three trial, it takes about two to three years um, longer to get published if it's non-significant compared to being significant. It has taken about the same time for the trial to be completed, but uh, it's taking longer after the trial to be, uh, is completed to get published if you are unlucky to have a non-statistically significant result. Here's uh, another field, uh, biomarkers. This is TP53 as a marker for survival in head and neck cancer. TP53 is uh, one of the landmark molecules in carcinogenesis. Uh, thousands of publications, is it related to mortality risk in people with head and neck cancer? So uh, we do a meta-analysis to try to find out. And uh, Panayotis Kizas, who led that effort, did a very thorough job, came out with 18 studies. But then we said, that's too few. There may be more. So we, we tried to unearth the whole literature about head and neck uh, cancer and survival. And uh, then we find that there's another 13 studies that the information is available, but it has not been indexed because it's somewhere in the fine print, some supplement, some online, or, or whatever. And then there's many more studies that we ask investigators for information, and we get 10 more studies worth of information. There's 23 more that clearly the data are the available. Uh, mortality is alluded, TP53 <coughs> has been measured, but the investigators don't get back to us. Another 15 studies where TP53 has been measured. There's no allusion to mortality, but the one thing that any investigator would know about his or her patients is whether they're alive or dead. And then who knows how many others that have absolutely no clue uh, and no sign of their existence somewhere in the universe of information. So if, if we run a meta-analysis in the first slice, which is what most meta-analysis would do, and it would be considered to be very well done, TP53 is a highly statistically significant predictor of mortality. It's the strongest predictor of mortality that we know of for head and neck cancer. If we add the second slice, the first two slices, then TP53 has a borderline association. And if we add the third slice, the three slices combined, then there's no association at all. I don't know what would happen with the inclusion of additional data. Maybe it would become a protective factor, or who knows. Here's a number of my markers. Um, these are papers that have received the highest number of citations in the biomedical literature describing specific biomarkers. Many of them are in clinical use or close to clinical use. And we tried to see whether the relative risk described in the highly cited study is the same, larger or smaller, compared to the relative risk in the largest study. And you see that almost all of the action is below the diagonal, which means that the largest study almost always finds far more conservative results. Actually, the largest study typically finds either null results or small effects. So I, I don't want to say that these biomarkers have absolutely no association, but really if the relative risk is just 1.1 or 1.2, uh, one would not like to pursue that further for clinical implementation. This is looking at cardiovascular biomarkers. Uh, I was surprised to find out that uh, there are several biomarkers in cardiovascular disease that have been studied in tens of thousands of papers. So triglycerides, for example, 
There's about 100,000 papers on triglycerides in PubMed. Uh, there's about 30,000 on uric acid. There's more than 40,000 on C-reactive protein and so forth. And this is the number of uh, papers with cardiovascular focus. And, and this is the latest update from meta-analysis of these markers. So triglycerides, the adjusted relative risk is 0.99 from 0.94 to 1.05. So after 100,000 papers, we have managed to narrow the confidence interval to uh, being sure that triglycerides don't have an independent effect in predicting cardiovascular risk. Uh, you know, maybe we could have reached that with a bit less than 100,000 papers. Uh, but um, most of, of these markers, uh, as I mentioned earlier, it's not that they are completely null. They, they have some effects. So CRP, for example, has survived with 1.4. Nothing compared with uh, the original promise, uh, New England Journal of Medicine paper suggesting relative risk of 3 or 4 rather than 1.3 or 1.4. Um, and obviously not causal. We have strong evidence now that CRP is not causally related. So maybe some soft, small, non-causal associations are there. The question is what to do with them and, and whether they would be useful one way or another. We can even put some modeling in the selection process. So here's a, a simple model. These are the results that you would expect. And you have classic publication bias that would remove some of that central piece of null results, and that's what you would end up with. And uh, you can think of different models applying different selection pressures. And uh, what kind of selection pressure could operate in the literature? Here's uh, a meta-analysis that I want us to think about. Uh, this looks like a perfect meta-analysis, isn't it? Uh, let, let me guide you through it. It's about a topic that I have no clue about. I'm, I'm not an expert on uh, the association of vermal lobules six to eight with uh, the risk of autism. But, but people here are measuring some part of the brain, the cerebellum, and they're saying whether the, the volume of that area is associated with the risk of having autism. As, as simple as that, but don't ask me for details. And um, here are the studies. Uh, here's the summary diamond. The summary diamond is formally significant uh, from minus 0.51 to minus 0.03. These are standardized effects. The standardized effect is a minus 0.27, kind of a small effect or a very small effect. And uh, the individual studies uh, are not heterogeneous. A heterogeneity test doesn't show any significant heterogeneity. Uh, most of them are on the right side, as we would wish them to be. And even better, there's one, two, three, four, five studies that have shown that association to be significant independently. What else would you wish? You know, extremely nice replication, five independent studies, meta-analysis with significant results, no heterogeneity, high consistency. One problem, these studies, most of them are about 10 to 20 cases and controls. So the power of each one of these studies to find a small effect size of that range, 0 0.27, is like 8%, 7%, 10%. The expectation that I would have five nominally significant results from studies of 10 cases and 10 controls is extremely implausible. You can run the calculations. It, it cannot happen. So what happened here? Well, is it that studies disappeared? I don't think so. I think that possibly what happened, and this is some paranoid ideation now, is that maybe that result should not have been here. Maybe it should have been a little bit more to the right. But someone had to cross that magic line one way or another and get a significant result. Here's another high-tech field, microRNAs. I guess it's going to be the next Nobel Prize. Um, and we tried to look at how many studies have found associations of microRNAs with human cancer risk for different types of cancers, different types of microRNAs. There's a few non-significant studies that I'm not showing here. But look at all these significant studies. Almost all of them, they barely scratch that line of non-significance. So it, it, it seems like everybody was just trying to, to pass that threshold and then be perfectly happy. <laughs> Another example, randomized trials on one of the most commonly studied uh, treatments, steroids. Steroids have been used for everything that you can imagine. I mean, if you can think of one disease that steroids have not been tried, please let me know. There's about 2,000 trials on steroids. And uh, since I was very lazy, I only got 14 of them on that forest plot. They're on very diverse indications, so it's an apples and oranges type of uh, forest plot. And I 
have to tell you, and you have to believe me, these are the results according to intention to treat, including the whole cohort, full follow-up for all of these different indications. If you read the papers, nine of the 14 largest trials on steroids claim significant mortality benefits. So, hmm, where are they? I see one here, but it's in the wrong direction. Um, <laughs> so, you know, steroids for head injury increase the risk of uh, mortality, actually, uh, by 20 to 25% on our elder risk scale. So all the others, uh, if you do the proper analysis, full intention to treat, full randomized, full follow-up, they're not really nominally significant, but it, uh, several of them claim significance. So if you take that one, myocardial infarction, uh, clearly nowhere close to statistical significance. But if you read the paper, it says that um, Patients randomized to steroids had a benefit with reduced mortality from seven hours to 24 hours and from the first week to three weeks. So this means that uh, if you are given steroids for the seven hours, uh, you need to survive. You need to try hard. But then if you survive the first seven hours, from seven hours to 24 hours, you're going to do great. Then you have six difficult days to go through. Then for <laughs> two weeks, you're going to do great, and then you will die. Uh, so it, it's... It's all reported, distorted, reported analysis that make a claim of significant results. Some of them may be true, I cannot tell, but uh, I guess that many of them probably are not. There's lots of brain studies, not phrenology nowadays. We have very uh, sophisticated technologies like MRI, fMRI, PET, and, and so forth. And uh, this is a summary of several such meta-analyses looking at uh, association of brain volumes in particular structures of the brain with the risk of having some mental disease, uh, like the one that I showed you on autism, you see all of the effect sizes are practically very small. There's a 0.77 standardized effect up here, but this is the exception. All the others are very close to 0, 0 0.2, 0 0.3. And these studies, on average, have 10 cases and 20, or, or, or 20 cases and, and 20 controls. So their power is dismal. If you estimate, based on power considerations, how many significant results you would expect in these studies, they're about half or a third compared to the significant results that you get, even with very, very conservative assumptions. So th there's clear excess significance. I have tried to present a simplified story that people are always chasing significant results. That's not true. Sometimes non-significant results could be very attractive, and this is a situation that uh, I have tried to use the term Proteus phenomenon to describe. Proteus was a god in Greek mythology, so he was an oracle and people were trying to get hold of him to ask him important questions like, is this research finding correct or wrong? Uh, but he was very evasive, uh, so he would change from fire to water, and uh, then it was very hard to get an answer. Th this is what we see, fire becoming water. Uh, a first study claiming a huge effect, an effect that is so huge that no one else sees that again in the future. And then within a year, another study showing a very conservative effect, an effect that is so conservative that, again, no one sees it again uh, in the future. And then subsequent studies fall somewhere in the middle. So it seems like there's an opportunity window within the first year or two for someone to kill that original discovery. And that pattern may operate when you can run a study pretty quickly. So for example, if the original discovery was a randomized trial that took 20 years of follow-up, if you want to kill it, you need to start now and wait for 20 years and you know, wish you, you are alive by then. Uh, but if, if it's a case control study and you just need to get some samples from the fridge and you see that paper published in Nature and you say, what are they talking about? I, I've, I've done that analysis. Let, let me run a few more samples and get a more conclusive re negative result. Then a negative result could be attractive. So you can model all of these processes of uh, publication bias, selection, processes, produce, and uh, this is uh, what I did with uh, Thomas Pfeiffer and Lars Bertram using about 2,000 papers on genomic associations on Alzheimer's disease. You have to believe me that the Proteus model, which includes uh, selection, strong selection force early on for positive results, less selection force for positive results later on, a Proteus effect in the first few years is the best fitting. It may be strong, but that's what we got. Any solutions? What could we do? So there's a few things that we could do. And uh, I will try to run through them in the last uh, eight to 10 minutes, or less, probably, because otherwise uh, I will be competing against lunch. Uh, learning to live with small and tiny effects. I think that many of the effects in nature, in medicine, in biomedicine, uh, useful effects may be very tiny. Uh, 
I've cataloged a number of them uh, that have relative risk less than 1.05 or higher than 0 0.95, significant but tiny. And uh, I think it's nice to know about them. So I, I showed you the data about diet and cancer. And uh, if you take fruit and vegetable in association with cancer risk, the latest meta-analysis suggests a relative risk that is highly statistically significant, and it's 0.999 per serving. So I love fruit, I love vegetables, so I will continue eating that. It's not bad for my health, it's gonna help a little bit. I may live a few days longer or a few months, so if I'm lucky, who knows. Uh, but you know, I, I think knowing about small effects could be useful. Adjusting effects downwards. Uh, if you read a paper in uh, a journal that is under high selection pressure, high impact, 4% uh, acceptance rate going down to 2% next year, uh, and that result comes from a small study with a limited number of events, you may have to deflate your estimate of the effect. Uh, empirically, we've shown that that is the case when you look at papers published in New England Journal of Medicine, Lancet, or JAMA, and there's more than 30 events that uh, really determine the outcome. Getting used to estimating credibility uh, in different types of research. So try to run through the data, use a Bayesian model, anything you like, and try to reach a conclusion. That result that I see here, how likely is it to be true? Obviously, if you use different priors, you may reach different conclusions, and you may compete against your colleagues who have different views for different conclusions. But it's good to know at what ballpark these conclusions are. Large-scale collaboration. I think that the, the prospect of running single team siloed research is not working. Uh, several fields have made major strides by being able to combine their forces and run very large studies that um, have the benefit of combining all the teams working in one discipline and finding some more reliable results. So for smoking cessation behavior, uh, we run a large consortium with 150,000 participants from 100 teams around the world, and we ended up finding three genes that are associated with smoking behavior. Prior to doing that, we thought that there were 359 genes that we were confident that were associated with smoking behavior. Now we know that there are three. And uh, is that bad news? Well, we know that these three are probably correct, while the 359 were probably a misunderstanding. Clearly, any effort to improve reporting, as has been highlighted in this meeting, is worth pursuing further. And I, I think that we can definitely do better, and uh, Equator has really led the way in, in that regard. I would argue that we need to register everything and publish everything. This is one example where even though things are registered, very th few things are published. Um, influenza vaccines um, have been tested in about 80 randomized trials that have been registered, but only about a quarter of them were published. And this is what happened to them. The first ones were published in a journal with impact factor of about 50, you can guess what. Uh, then you go down to 30s, and uh, if you're late a few months, then you have to compromise with impact factors of 10. And if you're two years late, you have to publish two trials in the same paper in a journal with impact factor of 1.5, because otherwise it will not be published. Um, and the rest of the data are just not available. We don't know what happened. I don't want to run a conspiracy theory that, H that uh, H1N1 vaccines are not effective. I think that they are effective, but really 75% of the data are nowhere to be found. Public availability of published research data in high impact journals, I think, could make a difference in improving the transparency and the completeness of the research record. This is from an empirical evaluation that we did recently looking at the 50 journals that have the highest impact factors in the scientific literature. And uh, this is whether they have policies for sharing in public different types of uh, information, materials, protocols, and whether it's also a condition of publication to really share that information in public with people who want to use it. And you see lots of action here, lots of green color, which is good news, although some of the big clinical journals actually are in the white. And uh, that's, I think, a very good start. The problem is when you look at that tiny column that I'm sure that you cannot read from a distance, but uh, there's tons of zeros here. And this is how many out of 10 papers that we looked in these journals actually implemented these policies. So most of the time, even though the policies were there, the policies were not implemented. Does that matter? Well, it does matter because uh, if you cannot access these data, you cannot really be sure what they look like. And Peter uh, Doshi gave us a very nice example of how that could be misleading. A couple of years ago, we uh, got in touch with uh, the editor of Nature Genetics. Nature Genetics has a policy of 
full deposition of raw data, protocols, and analysis codes for every paper that has to be published in Nature Genetics and Microarrays. Otherwise, if you don't make that available in public, it's not going to be published. So we got about 20 microarray specialists around the world, and uh, four teams of them tried to replicate 18 papers. They could do that only for two papers of the 18. And for others, there were discrepancies. Uh, discrepancies uh, when processed data were used, uh, no possibility to use raw data, uh, partial reproduction from discrepancies, or no reproduction at all. And the reason was that even though it was a prerequisite to publication, the data were not available, software was uh, homemade and had disappeared in the meanwhile, the methods were very unclear, or the meta-analyst, uh, the, the microarray analyst got completely different results. Can we find ways of rewarding people who produce reproducible research? If we make research more open and more transparent, then we can have reproducibility checks and we can help people promote their careers and move them along if they have reproducible findings. Now, the alternative is to punish those who don't have reproducible findings. I'm, I'm always wanting to, to think positive rather than negative, but I, maybe we need to think that publishing significant results is just too easy. So why should we promote that and reward that? We want to promote and reward reproducible results, not significant results. And reproducibility could happen along the spectrum of research from analytical validity level, repeatability, replication, external validation, clinical validity, and clinical utility. So to end, um, this is a Greek quote uh, from a scientist who was very, very curious, uh, Empedocles. Uh, he was so passionate with science that in order to find out how volcanoes work, he dropped himself in a crater of, uh, of Etna, and that was the last experiment. Um, and um, this is a very interesting quote. Αυτό μόνον πιστέντες ότο προσέκησεν έκαστος πάντος ελαυνόμενοι το δόλον πας εύχεται ευρύν. They were convinced only about whatever fragment each of them happened to hit upon, as they were overwhelmed on all sides by information, while certainly they would have wished to find the whole. And I think that this is what we suffer. Uh, we have research that's mostly an advertisement. It's not the scientific record. It's a small piece that advertises the scientific record. And uh, the relationship to research is of the same level as the relationship between a summary statement of the plot of uh, Euripides and the unknown text of a tragedy of Euripides that uh, burnt in the library of Alexandria. Registration it is a wonderful idea, but it's also much like knowing that the tragedy existed and maybe bits and pieces about the plot, but this doesn't mean that we can recreate Euripides. So a future goal, I think, and this echoes what several people have discussed today, I think that all research data should be available in public by default. I think there should be some reason not to do that. Uh, and I can think of a few reasons, maybe sometimes, but otherwise I think they should be available by default. This should include protocols and analysis codes. I think that we have to think about other ways of approaching science. It could be seen as an open crowdsourcing for research rather than just have siloed single investigators trying to get the most out of tons of data. We can also consider live streaming of research in the making. So uh, this is done in some fields like uh, reproduction of the experiments on arsenic bacteria. You can go to a website every day and see what were the latest experiment done and what happened, what went wrong, what went okay. And I think that eventually uh, we have to find a way to make the scientific record complete rather than fragmented and opportunistic. Uh, I'd like to close just showing a few names of uh, some of my collaborators. Uh, they have done all the uh, good work that you have seen, and all the errors and mistakes are definitely mine. Thank you.